Hi, I'm very happy to be here today, and thanks to all the organizers for all of their work on this panel and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about series, because I am odd on this panel, not just because I'm the only one under six feet tall, but also because um, I'm representing a US-based nonprofit. Um, so Ceres is an advocate for sustainability leadership, and we work to mobilize business and investor leaders on sustainability issues, working for sustainable markets and ultimately a sustainable world. Um, we're based on three networks. Um, we have our coalition, uh, which includes um, the socially responsible investment firms and some smaller boutique firms, as well as other NGOs and nonprofits working on various environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, we also have our investor network, which at the moment has uh, just over 100 members representing over 10 trillion in assets. Uh, it's the investor network on climate risk, or INCR. And we also have our company member network, which is um, oh, just over 70 companies. The majority of them um, are North American-based multinationals in a variety of sectors. Um, and all three of those groups work to move each other, um, as well as policymakers and other market players to, to achieve our, our sustainability goals. Um, we have sort of a, a foundational document that we released in 2010 called the Series Roadmap for Sustainability. And that document lays out our expectations and vision of what a 21st century corporation looks like. Um, and that covers four areas, governance, disclosure, stakeholder engagement, and then the bulk of the report centers on performance. Um, and again, that covers broad sustainability issues, not just water. Um, in October of 2011, our water program, which is now about four or five years old, released the Series Aqua Gauge. And that's basically a deep dive on water um, that is also based on our series roadmap. So it covers um, similar focus areas and takes a similar approach to water issues as the roadmap does to sustainability broadly. Um, so now that you know sort of where we sit in this space and where our perspective is coming from, I'm going to walk you through some of the trends that we see and, and getting a bit to some of those players that are a little bit longer term that we do work with um, and, and some, some movement that we are seeing in, in the financial and investment and corporate communities. Um, and then I'm just going to tell you a bit about one of our latest reports and draw a couple of insights from um, a report that we released in June called Clearing the Waters. So first, just a couple of examples, and one from Bloomberg, um, <laughs> that highlight some of the trends that we're seeing. So since we do work with these broad networks, um, we see trends on sort of a broader scale than one might be able to, to spend time in working you know, at, at one institution or another. Um, so the CDP water survey is a great, great example of investor support. Um, support keeps going up in the 100, 150% this year and seems to be continuing on that trend that now represents 470 investors managing 50 trillion in assets, which is you know not small. Um, shareholder proposals and the more um, the the sort of activist uh, share owners that file these proposals with with companies. We saw 42 proposals filed in 2011 and 2012 asking for disclosure of both water risk as well as management response. And that's an area where Ceres is really interested and in where the Aqua Gauge um, let, tries to set out some, some expectations and standards there. Um, Bloomberg has their new Water Insights product that's designed to help um, uh, analysts and portfolio manage, managers to identify water risks in their investments. So taking a new lens, showing, bringing that data to one place to a commonly used platform um, for you know, the faith-based and socially responsible investors as well as the more mainstream um, investment community there. And then Standard & Poor's has an increased focus on water risks in research and rating methodologies. And um, we also have a report called The Ripple Effect that looks at some of these embedded water risks in financing mechanisms like municipal bonds. Um, and then Wall Street. We're seeing a lot of research, sell-side research coming out, those little one-pagers that we, we all get in our, in our inboxes. Um, a lot of them are focusing on water risk, are talking about water issues, whether in a particular geography, industry, or just broadly um, looking, at, looking at that. And I, I should take a moment just to, to emphasize that we do work more closely with institutional investors, so those pension funds and so forth um, at Ceres, than with the finance community directly. So direct all your specific questions to these guys. Um, 
So in June, we released a, a little report called Clearing the Waters. Um, and this was an update of some work we did in 2010 looking at water risk disclosure um, by companies in eight water intensive sectors. And those are the sectors listed there, uh, many of the ones that we heard about in John's embedded water risk slide um, earlier. So in 2010, we looked at both voluntary and mandatory disclosures of water risk. And we also worked to start on the definitions note, um, defining physical, reputational, litigation, and regulatory risks related to water. So um, we, we have our definitions set out both in the 2010 report and in this one, um, if we want to bring those out and debate them. Um, so at about the same time that we released this report, the SEC released their guidance on disclosing water-related risks um, that are directly tied to climate change in financial filings. So the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission came out and basically said that if you have material business risks related by climate change, we need to see them in your annual reports. So that's 10Ks, 20Fs, and 40Fs um, are the names of these wonderful, colorful forms. Um, so basically, um, two years later, we decided to go back and look at the same universe, look at everybody who was filing one of those forms, and see if we were seeing an increase in this disclosure as one would expect to see in the wake of SEC guidance in an SEC document. Um, so looking at the, the graph on the left, the green bars are 2011, so these were filings that were filed with the SEC in 2011, um, versus the 2009 filings in blue, and that's what was discussed in the, in the 2010 report. Um, so we are seeing increases. There's still quite a bit of work to do, and we can get into a long debate about what they're saying and what maybe they should be saying in these filings, but overall it's moving in the right direction and we're seeing more, more disclosure from companies on water risks in these different categories. Um, we were particularly interested in the physical risk category, and that's, you know, that's your, your floods, your droughts, your more direct, um, that should be particularly obvious, we, we think, from our perspective, and would probably be what you see pop up first right after whoever's suing them at the moment. Um, and then uh, perhaps a bit more interesting, at least from my perspective, is making the climate connection. So this is a look at all of the companies that made the direct connection to the water risks they were disclosing and climate change. And we were pretty, pretty strict on awarding credit um, in this category. So the companies that are represented here, um, and I just have the percentages up here, but I'm happy to, to walk through who they are uh, if anyone has questions later. Um, but we're, we're seeing a market increase in the number of companies that are saying we're facing this risk and it's caused by climate change, which is pretty huge. And again, these are Securities and Exchange Commission documents. They're not geared at consumers. They're not geared at you know, the, the corporate social responsibility audience. There's nothing to be gained from greenwashing. These are just risks. Um, so yeah, again, we're, we're seeing 83% of the beverage industry, but most of the other industries, there's, st there's still a long way to go in, in terms of recognizing these risks. And you know, particularly in some of the, the heavier industries, we expect if one of you faces this risk, likely you're, you're all facing it somewhere. Um, so that's just kind of a, a look at where we stand. Um, we know these issues are hitting home. And now the question for us is, you know, what are we going to do about them? And we believe that you know, there's maybe a bit of a lack of policy leadership on some of these issues in the United States. And we think that companies and the private sector in general um, have, have a big voice in this and a big a big role to play. Um, and so I'll just sort of end with our my kind of call to action and our perspective that companies need to self-check on these issues. And that include I'm including the investment community as well. Investors need to check their portfolios, need to understand these issues. Companies need to understand their risks and how they're disclosing and managing. Um, and, and bring that corporate voice forward in support of sustainable water management.